This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. If a person really sees himself as a son of God with a fragment of infinity within himself, begins to have that new high concept of his own being and nature, then he finds a new ability to deal differently with the world and to treat other people differently as brothers. Well, it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Has to do with uh, self-image, maybe, huh? I would say that, for one thing, spiritual truth does change the self-image. Would you agree? Right. Oh, yeah. I think psychology and spirituality, it all blends together, and it shouldn't be breaking down into compartments, actually. It all works together. As a matter of fact, this is the very problem which psychology refers to as the identity crisis that a good many people go through of not knowing who on earth they are. A person can know his license plate number, student registration that's number. Right, right now, I think that's my problem exactly. I'm just confused, you know. I think man uh, needs something to grasp more than himself. I think by himself man is a very weak animal, really. I think man has been grasped by God in the sense that man is valuable spiritually in this universe and that you're a son of God, that this planet is a family, really, that this is the nature of man. Uh, it sounds good. I'm not, I don't believe it though in my heart, you know. I, I mean, uh, I, I've looked at a lot, a lot of ways and I think, you know, there should be something to hold on to. But I just haven't gotten to the point where I can say, yes, I really believe that one thing, you know. Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish existentialist philosopher, whom you may have read. Have you ever read any? No, I haven't. Describe this very point at which you're standing as being the edge of a precipice and a person comes to the necessity of making a leap of faith. Finally, there's no proof, there's no logic, there's nothing I can feed into a computer and get it out on punch cards to say, yes, you're a son of God, yes, this is a friendly universe, there's an infinitely loving being at the helm of history and all, <laughs> and you have a divine destiny beyond the stars. I couldn't prove it, and yet I've made that leap, and I've found that somehow my inward being and in essence responds to it. It feels right. It's a somehow registered consciousness, indeed, that it was true, that it didn't deceive me when I put my weight of experience on it. And beginning to believe and live as a son of God has that same experience to it, and you can find that. Uh, I think it's very possible. I think the belief is a thing. Once a person believes something, it will change him, and he will go toward that belief, definitely. You were bringing up psychology, and I think witness the fact that a person who really believes that he is worthless, who, for example, during the period of his parental training was almost conditioned to think of himself as awkward, no value, you'll never amount to anything, etc. And he'll generally end up fulfilling that self-fulfilling prophecy. I think also this kind of faith in the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man, that one is a son or a daughter of the living God, is likewise a self-fulfilling prophecy in that it really makes that kind of a palpable difference. I agree with that, right. I think it's very simple. If a person is told, for example, that it's necessary to go through rituals and believe creeds and recite catechisms and all this kind of thing, these are nothing, I think, but essentially barriers between the individual and the experiential realization of the finding of God, which I think does not depend on any of those other superficial things. I agree with that. Yeah. I've learned to believe that. And it's a life-transforming thing. That's my experience. I think uh, in the times today, people need it more than anything. I mean. They realize that there's just a tremendous emptiness. Need spiritual truth. Right, exactly. Do you agree with that? No, I, I don't think that uh, I myself don't, don't need a belief in anything outside myself. I accept no authority and I uh, take things as they come. When you say you don't believe in anything outside of yourself, you're not referring to such obvious things as the law of gravity or... <laughs> oh, right. Well, I, I believe in, uh, in nature as, I can, as much as I can perceive it. But uh, well, I think that... Uh, if you can look at man as, um, as kind of an accident in the universe, so you can look at you can look at life as uh, as a natural outgrowth of, of matter. That matter tends toward complexity, and life is a is a much more complex state of matter than than, than just uh, than just atoms or, or a simpler state of, of matter. And it's true that matter does tend toward complexity, but on the other hand, the principle of thermodynamics of entropy is that, in fact, things begin and are running down, so that there would have to have been some initiating point in all creation, which is one reason some people believe in God, incidentally. Well, man uh, may solve his, his problems. Man may be able to, to control nature. If man does solve his problems, he'll, uh, he'll have all the attributes of what we now consider to be a god. And I which would you... That, yeah. I think, to continue the, this... Complexity. Uh, mind is a much more uh, complex state than than uh, than mere life. And, and spirit might be more complex than mind. Right. Exactly. You were saying that man can learn to control nature. I agree with that. What about man learning to control his own nature, which is perhaps even a greater challenge? Well, I think uh, we're getting to that. We're, as uh, Buckminster Fuller says, the the earth is a 
a spaceship. The only problem is we didn't receive an instruction manual, and we're in the process of writing that now. Once we get that written, uh, we shouldn't have any more trouble flying the thing. Another way to put it is that this planet is a neighborhood, but it is not yet a brotherhood. That is to say, we're in such close physical propinquity that a person can go from California to Bombay, India, or to any place around the world in a matter of hours, and yet people are not thinking of themselves as members in one family, which I think is crucial. Mm. All oh, right, I, and the point that he said that we've we've learned to control nature. I think that's totally wrong. I think nature really will control us in the well, end. Did, huh? uh, Didn't you said we're learning to control it, or we may learn to? I don't mean to uh, to to warp it. I mean to uh, to accept uh, the rules of it and work with work within that. There, but there are a great many things that we can change. Uh, we um, we've made a lot of mistakes, but uh, that's what we're just seeing now. Yeah. <laughs> we're just starting to see the mistakes. And the mistakes we've made in attempting to control nature, you mean? Right. I mean, uh, I don't know where this is growing out. You probably know more about this than I do, obviously. The, the idea that man was put on the earth and nature was for his, uh, for his use, totally. I think that's a misinterpretation of, uh, of the scripture, probably. That, uh, do you know the exact part there that says, uh, it's probably in Genesis or something like that. Know. But, it, but anyway, to take dominion of the earth, he created the world and God said that it was good and this sort of thing. Right, and I think in saying that, he meant that we were supposed to uh, use nat nature for all of man and that we should learn to live in equilibrium with it. And that is the way that we should use it, not to uh, do what we're doing today. Actually. It's not only good religion, it's good ecology, you're citing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Precisely. I agree with that very strongly. If this planet is our home, we'd better do some house cleaning. And in the same sense that if the physical body is the temple of God, if man has spiritual potentials, that his physical health, that being a unified and integrated person inwardly, the old Roman ideal of mens sana and corpore sano, I believe was how it went, a sound mind and a sound body. In other words, that there would be a totality, that man spiritually be aware that he has cravings after truth, beauty, goodness, love too, these higher things that are not satisfied just by a full stomach. Yeah, I agree totally with that. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, but to get, if we could get, yeah, uh, to get back to, uh, to ecology, uh, I think that uh, once man understands something, like once he understands it, it ceases to be greater than him. He can, if he fully understands it, then he can control it. Our problems so far in ecology have been that we haven't understood the things that we thought we did. We didn't see all the ramifications. But uh, I think everything in nature can, is can be submitted to knowledge by man. And I think the analogy extends also in that the better man is able to understand himself, physically, psychologically, and spiritually, the better he'll be able to control himself. That is to say, be able to deliver himself from the deleterious manifestations of anger, of hatred, of hostility, and violence which have characterized this planet for the past decades and generations. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, rather than use the word control in talking about nature, I think we could use the Indians, American Indians, as a model almost. And these were very spiritual people. I mean, when they looked at nature, this, uh, this was a very spiritual thing for them, the land, the Mother Earth, and all of that. And uh, so I think that we could look at that and realize that there, there is a definite spiritual need that goes in to living in an equilibrium with uh, a spiritual outlook toward life, a person recognizing these higher values of truth, beauty, goodness, and love, makes a profound difference in the way he deals with material reality even, I believe. In the same way that one syllable shouted in a cave or cavern may have many echoes and repercussions, so a person really believing that he's a member of a family, that this planet is the family of God, that the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man are a fact that man has a spiritual side to his life as well as the intellectual and the physical, makes a difference in the way he deals with and treats reality. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's hard for me to come back when you've said all of that. But when I look at why is it hard to come back when I've said all that? <laughs> I don't know. My mind isn't working that fast, maybe. I wonder how is man going to get together, you know, uh, it, you know, and be a family, like you say. I mean, I'm very, I really am pessimistic about that. Well, it may indeed make you wonder how man can get together, but it almost does convince you that God must have a sense of humor, doesn't it? <laughs> Do I? Ah, yes, definitely. <laughs> this is my conviction, too, that in fact the deity has a divine whimsy at times looking at the way, for example, people in his name have done everything from go to war to build walls against each other when in fact the high function of religion ought to be to join people as members in one family. It needs to be profound instead of superficial. I remember when I was a little boy discovering two different ways to tell whether my face was clean after I'd washed my face. Either I could look at the mirror or I could look at the towel. 
And in the one case, I was actually getting my face clean. In the other case, I was just redistributing the dirt. I think that's what a great deal of religion has done in a very superficial sense. Only redistributed the dirt and rearranged man's prejudices under a different <laughs> hierarchy or way of describing it. But that authentic religion really gives a man a profound inward love. If he feels infinitely loved himself, he can love other people in a new way. I don't think it's necessary to feel uh, infinitely loved uh, to love other people. It's just uh, something that, that you can realize. Uh, and dealing with other people, that, that there are certain ways that, that, it, that it's good for you to behave, regardless of whether you b believe in a, a God. For example, to do to another as you would have him do to you? Right. I agree. A person would not have to believe theistically in the existence of a God in order to treat other people in a moral manner, keep his name off the police blotter and out of the papers and so forth. But I think when it comes to this other area of actually being able to love enemies, being able to turn the other cheek, being able to love those who hate a person, at that point more than a general amiability is required. I think some real spiritual muscle is required, which a great many people don't have without prayer, meditation, and worship. You know what I mean? Well, I'm not sure it's necessary to love your neighbors. Uh, love your, your enemies, you know. Um. Oh, you're right, it's not necessary, and in fact, most of human history would bear out the fact that very few people have done it. And look where we are. Right. And look where we are. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. And ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. This offers simple, understandable answers to some of the most perplexing questions confronting modern humankind, such as, who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The title of this free booklet, containing transcripts of unrehearsed, spontaneous question and answer sessions on campus, is Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, The Fatherhood of God, The Brotherhood of Man, and Growing Spiritually, about the processes of inward discovery and adventure, the new power and purpose potential for every human life. Another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. And for those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. It's box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. <laughs>